days before the coup, had become Allende's last Minister of Defense. On the day of the coup itself, he'd been arrested by Pinochet and had then spent over a year in one of Chile's notorious detention camps. He'd been forced into exile and was now living in Washington. September 21st, um, in the morning when he was going to his office along with two colleagues, Michael Moffat and Ronnie Moffat, um, a, a bomb was detonated, which ripped through the floor of his seat and um, which se severed his legs at the, at the thigh, and he bled to death, I'd say not more than 200 meters from what was our home for a time, which was the residence of the Chilean embassy in Washington, D.C. All those who were ministers of defense during the Allende government, um, without an exception, um, were killed by the military government. General Prats, who had been commander in chief of the army, was assassinated in Argentina, and then my father. The FBI launched a major investigation, as did the Justice Department. And within days, the FBI was reporting that this was uh, an act carried out by Operation Condor. Uh, a network of Southern Cone intelligence agencies which collaborated on attacks, surveillance, abductions, and even assassinations of its critics. And as the FBI cable points out, and we have it here, Chile is the center of Operation Condor. Uh, and the investigation um, really led to revelations about uh, who was in charge of these operations in Chile. Uh, Justice Department officials came away convinced that General Pinochet had to have known, had to have authorized this mission uh, before it could be undertaken. Condor was in effect the overseas arm of the DINA. Documents have now surfaced in Paraguay, which show that DINA boss Manuel Contreras asked General Pinochet directly for money and personnel to deal with his enemies outside Chile. For example, for example, we found this letter, which is from Contreras to Pinochet. In it, he requests an increase in his budget of $600,000 for Operation Condor. Additional cost, it says, for the neutralization of the main adversaries of the Junta abroad, especially in Mexico, Argentina, Costa Rica, the United States, France and Italy. The killing of Letelier caused a rift with his old friends, the Americans. The U.S. put pressure on Pinochet to rein in his secret police. It was disbanded not because Pinochet wanted that to be the case, but because when Dina decided to strike abroad, that was too much. And the United States put strong pressure, and some opponents of Dina within the military government were able to persuade also General Pinochet to disband that organization. In 1978, Pinochet granted an amnesty for all political crimes committed up to that date. The one exception, under pressure from the United States, was for the Letelier killing. When General Pinochet was arrested in England and detained for the courts to decide his fate, he was not without friends. People demanding he should be allowed home matched those who wanted him extradited, placard for placard. No voice was louder in his support than that of Lady Thatcher. Lady Thatcher, General Pinochet's old friend, who took tea with him before his arrest, said the general should be allowed to go home on compassionate grounds and for the good of relations between the two countries. In 1982, Mrs. Thatcher, as she then was, went to war with Argentina to win back the Falklands. Running a war thousands of miles away from home was not easy. The British needed a local base and local information on the enemy's movements. 
Augusto Pinochet was about the only person in South America to be on side immediately and to be extremely practical with their support. The Chileans had got a great deal of information about order of battle and deployment, and they shared that information straight away. This secret support was almost given away when a seeking helicopter crash-landed inexplicably over Chilean territory. The passengers, later known to be SAS men, disappeared, while the five crew members were quickly rescued by Chilean forces. They were taken to Santiago and dropped off in the main square near the British consulate. He, so Everyone was surprised when these British pilots came wandering into the square in full combat uniform, dragging their parachutes behind them. Everyone was wondering, where did they come from? And where are the planes and helicopters? Due to adverse weather, it was not possible to return to our ship in this condition. We therefore sought refuge in the nearest neutral country. The Chileans were perfectly willing to accept the preposterous explanation that they had had a map reading error and they had navigated by mistake into Chile and had uh, crash landed. You have to understand what a real knife edge the whole Falklands campaign was. I mean, we so nearly uh, had uh, an appalling, humiliating defeat. I mean, it could have been a catastrophe, and Chilean assistance, in my judgment, uh, made the difference. All strategic decisions in Chile were taken by Pinochet personally. Mrs. Thatcher's government uh, depended entirely on retaking the Falklands. The people who came to her assistance at that time of need she unquestionably felt an enormous gratitude to, and that absolutely forged a strong link of trust. Pinochet could count on Baroness Thatcher, and indeed certain senators in the United States. Their idea is that we are right, but we're maligned. The majority of, of, of people have been influenced by Marxist ideas, but history will prove us right, even though we're in a minority in this moment in time. It wasn't just the Falklands that brought them closer together. Britain by now was going through its own economic revolution, and one of its gurus, Thatcher's advisor Alan Walters, found the two leaders shared some essential economic and political priorities. I think his admiration for Mrs. Thatcher rose to an all-time peak. Uh, when she clearly beat the communist miners. He regarded communism as the, the, deed of the, the deed of the devil, I think. And he said what he wanted to do, his object there, was to ensure that Chile never slipped back again into uh, the morass of communism. And he said, I know that I'll only do this when each family lives in its own house and it has its own car, car in the garage. Um, it says then they will never turn to communism. In 1979, Pinochet had opened Chile's first offshore oil well in the Magellan Strait. Although Chile, like many South American countries, was soon to go through a severe banking crisis, the general standard of living for most of the population was rising steadily. The austerity of the early Pinochet days had gone, and a growth rate from the mid-80s of 8% meant the shops were full of people with money to spend. Pinochet was the man that led economic revolution in Latin America from a macro sense. Uh, that is, to get away from the fascist economic model that Chile to a certain degree had, Argentina had, and certainly Brazil had, where the government was heavily involved in all of the means of production. Chile's a miracle economy, and it's outdoing Hong Kong. If this goes on for another 10 years, then the income per capita of Chile will be well overtaking the income of per capita of the United Kingdom. Chile opened its economy, led the way in, in changing how uh, uh, economies and governments uh, are supposed to work in the hemisphere.
Chilean model is held up and was copied by the Argentinians and the Brazilians and the Mexicans to a certain degree and, 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 and others. And so what he had done was important. There was another side to Chile's rebirth. In 1986, 13 years after the coup, political activity was still heavily restricted. So what, said Pinochet to Alan Walters? He says, uh, I think I've liberated Chileans, uh, and for which they've paid a small price. How much time, he said, this is, yes, this is very funny. He says, how much time do you spend earning your living and doing your shopping? And how much time do you spend in political meetings? Which is the most important? <laughs> it wasn't a joke everyone shared. On September the 7th, 1986, General Pinochet was returning to Santiago as he always did after the weekend. He had his grandson with him. Lying in wait were 12 members of an armed wing of the Communist Party. There was a burst of gunfire and a rocket was launched at Pinochet's Mercedes. Five of his bodyguards were killed and his car riddled with bullets. But the rocket failed to explode and General Pinochet survived. Pinochet said that the bullet holes formed the shape of the Virgin Mary and that it was to her he owed his life. It must have reinforced a view of himself as his country's saviour that he'd expressed to several people, including the American ambassador. How come I'm not carried on your shoulders. It proves what I've always said. They are after me and, and I am the savior. I'm not the villain, I'm the savior. And, and this is not something he says. This is something, in my view, he absolutely believes. The next day, scores of people were arrested and several killed. In one incident, leather-jacketed secret policemen tried to drag two students out of a car belonging to a Dutch diplomat. The diplomat tried to take them to safety, but the police weren't standing on ceremony. The students were taken away and reportedly tortured. The truth was that although most Chileans were more prosperous, opposition to Pinochet's rule had never ended. It existed throughout Chilean society, from old enemies like communists to moderates who just wanted a return to democracy. This became even clearer next year when the Pope visited Chile. As the Pope arrived last night to start one of the most difficult trips of his papacy, he gave Chile his by now customary greeting. General Pinochet has always been a devout Roman Catholic who goes to Mass and Communion every week. He wanted the Pope to witness a country at peace with itself. But after the official party had moved on, trouble broke out in a park where the Pope had been. Demonstrators had been offering the Pope a different message that they didn't like Pinochet, whether he was a devout Catholic or not. The police moved in with water cannon to blow the evidence away. With the world's media watching like hawks, their efforts only underlined the demonstrators' message. Pinochet tried to manipulate the Pope's visit for his own ends, but the Pope had come to encourage the vast majority of Chileans who wanted democracy. It was a message Pinochet didn't want to hear. Democracy carried risks that ran counter to his belief in discipline. A discipline he applied not only to his country, but also to his own body. Every day he wakes up at six o'clock. Every day he does physical exercises. He doesn't drink alcohol, he doesn't smoke, and he, the best pleasure for him is to be with his family. By the end of the 80s, the image of Pinochet presented to the Chilean people was softening, as often that of the genial grandfather as the stern dictator. There was a reason for this. According to the constitution he himself had introduced, Pinochet had to put himself forward for presidential elections in 1988. 
It was an unusual election, with Pinochet the only candidate. In his favor, the economy, law and order, and his unquestioned financial incorruptibility. The ban on political parties was lifted a year before the election. The no voters were an unlikely coalition of conflicting ideologies, but they soon realized that their only chance of beating Pinochet was to sink their differences and campaign together. In his old age, Pinochet took enthusiastically to a new activity, electioneering. I travel around with him in Chile many times for the referendum. I had to visit many cities. I remember how he greeted the poor people remembering their names. He likes to repeat huh, the shopping that he did the, the last time he went to any, any city. Pinochet was told by his advisors he would win easily. He believed them. But to his astonishment, Pinochet lost. The nose got 54% of the vote. At first, he tried to keep the result secret. Pinochet delayed producing the results and considered the defeat until the wee hours of the morning. By 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, they admitted to defeat. Only after other members of the junta told the press, we lost. Pinochet was finished as head of state. Under the terms of his own constitution, he now had to call for true presidential elections. But he was defiant and blamed everyone else for his defeat. Nosotros hemos luchado en estos días, el 5 de octubre, con Rusia, con Estados Unidos, con los países europeos, con la Iglesia, en algunos señores. Hemos salido derrotados en un plebiscito, no vencidos, derrotados. Pero no olviden ustedes que en la historia del mundo hay un plebiscito en la cual juzgaban a Cristo y a Barrabás, y el pueblo votó por Barrabás. In his view, he is a genuine patriot, a savior. And it's just tough for those guys to let go. But he felt maybe that uh, he was a salvation for Chile. And even if you have elections and these people that don't feel as strong as he would, would somehow screw things up. The man who had outwitted or crushed every political adversary for 15 years had now been defeated by ordinary Chileans. They were tired of violence, tired of hating each other. But Pinochet still wanted his place in history and made an extraordinary request. I got a call from the Chilean embassy in Washington. I have a request from President Pinochet, who was still president at the time, that he wants to go to the UN. It's his last year in office. He wants to go and wants to give a report. I have saved Chile for democracy. I have lost the election. I'm turning it over. It's a democratic country. And that was his swan song. And he said, what do you think will happen? And I said, look, send him a telegram and said, don't go. He will be blown out of the water. It doesn't occur to him that he is not appreciated for what he did to save the country from communism. He thinks he did the right thing and everybody else is wrong in not understanding this. In 1998, Chile's Senate received a new and unelected member. General Pinochet had appointed himself senator for life. He thought that as such, he would also be immune from prosecution for life. 
On the day he took his seat, he was heckled. Some senators objected to his presence. Old Allende supporters and people who had lost members of their families. One of them was the son of the assassinated Orlando Letelier. This is a man who thought that this was normal also. And he's not aware of his role in history as a traitor. He thought he was saving the world. And he thought that that was right. And that is why, till present, he has never felt one drop of regret for anything he has done. There is no doubt about the violence that scarred Pinochet's time in office. No doubt either about the prosperity Chile enjoyed under his rule. The variable in the verdict of history is not the evidence, but the jury. He is not the beast just with blood coming out of the jaws. He was always a just man, a very severe about things that were right or wrong. He has the sense of God and also of his enormous love for his country. It's a great risk to say anything like this, but, but uh, you know, 3,000 people uh, to see a country turn around the way Chile's turn around uh, is, is a terrible price to pay, but a lot of countries have paid a whole hell of a lot worse. He's been seasoned and he's become more sophisticated, but he is the same man who carried out those actions, who laughed about other people's deaths. One can never forget that photograph of Pinochet on the day of the coup and having one power sitting there in this Prussian military uniform with his clipped hair, dark glasses on, unsmiling. The man I met was a man 25 years older, but he was the same man.